Trimmers. Um, and we will be recording these. We will be recording them in approximately our chunks or in the chunks that the speakers um, will be speaking. And, um, and so if you don't mind that the program is being recorded and you might be recorded if you ask a question, then just press continue. Um, Pat Bacallion is going to be recording them and then um, sometime next week, you will be getting these recordings. So you can use them, you can use them. If you're faculty, we welcome you to use them for your classes. If you found something really interesting and wanted to do a green bag lunch at, um, with fellow nurses sometime and watch it together, we really just want this information to get out broadly. I do want you to know that this program um, today is being sponsored by the California Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, as well as the National Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments by SEIU, which is Service Employees International Union, um, their Nurse Alliance. So they have um, a part of the union that uh, represents nurses, significant number of public health nurses, and ANA California. So these are all our co-sponsors for today. We also want you to know that this is part of a five-part series. So we're in number three today. The first one was on climate change. The second one was on air pollution and fire and, um, and really had some focus on transportation. Um, today obviously is food and agriculture and we are gonna have a session on water today and this, this afternoon. So important to food and agriculture, obviously. And um, on July 9th, we're going to be doing chemicals in our everyday lives. We will have a focus on pesticides that day. So we'll only talk a little bit about pesticides today, but we'll have an opportunity. You'll have an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper if that's of interest on July 9th. And then the last in this series is going to be on July 30th, when we're going to be talking about how we can green healthcare, whether you're in a hospital, whether you're a school nurse in your nursing suite there, a clinic, um, and if you're um, doing outreach in people's homes, how you can incorporate uh, greening sustainable uh, efforts there. We also are going to be offering, let's see, did I? Yes, and then we're also going to be doing a whole focused five-part series, one hour each in the evening. Um, this is Pacific time, seven to eight, starting June 24th, specifically on farm workers. Today, Barbara Hollinger will be doing a half an hour presentation on farm workers, merely as sort of a, a, a teaser, because there's so much we need to say about farm workers, health and safety. And that will be co-sponsored by the California Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and the California chapters of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. So um, we welcome you. You will be getting information on that. For those of you who are particularly interested in the plight of farm workers and their health and safety, um, we welcome you to join us then. For those of you who are interested, you will be receiving information from Pat Bacalian. Um, after we completed this, anybody who registered, um, you'll get a post-test. If you pass with 80% or better, Pat will then send you a certificate for your five and a half CEs that you'll be getting for this today's um, presentations. And um, as ever, there's always a person who's the glue person who kind of keeps us all together. And that is Pat Bacallan. You can see her beautiful face. She lives in an aquarium. And, um, and so uh, Pat just, you know, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you do to keep us rolling forward and getting educated and engaging. The program today is a long one from nine to 2.30. We are only going to be doing two 15 minute breaks. Um, it's Friday. We, uh, we really feel like we didn't wanna do a big break in the middle that you would probably rather just end early and get on with your weekend. Um, and we'll be recording in approximately one hour intervals. So five and a half hours is a long time to sit. As nurses, we don't recommend this. And so consider standing some of the time, 
um, you can go ahead and uh, un you don't unmute your video, but turn off your video and do a little happy dance or sway around a little bit so you get your circulation going because once again, it's a long period of time. I should have introduced myself to begin with, but I am Barbara Sattler. I'm going to do the first 25 minutes of the program. And um, this is going to be an amazingly quick sweep of overview of some of the public health implications and ecological health implications of food and agriculture production today. Um, we are going to have a series of other speakers that are going to talk about other aspects of food and agriculture. But one of the things that I, and, um, that I really wanna make sure you do for us is if we don't cover an area today that you are interested in and expected us to cover, Will you let Pat know because we will put together an hour long program or some equivalent uh, in the future and we may call upon you to help us um, co produce that. Um, and so I'm a professor emeritus at the University of San Francisco. I'm a founding member uh, and a current board member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Um, I'm part of the Leadership Council here in California where we're developing the first state level chapter for the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And my interest area, research area, um, grants and contracts over the last 30 plus years have been in environmental health. And for 10 years, I had USDA funding to help bring healthy, sustainable foods to healthcare. And so I have an abiding interest in uh, food and agriculture. Also teach a class at the University of San Francisco for nurses and public health people on the public health implications of food and agriculture. Um, this once again is a quick overview. Please let us know if we've missed something that you wanted to um, that you wanted to hear about and we'll make sure that we figure out how to cover it in the future. So first of all, I just would like to say that um, we have this idealized sense of what, um, what farms look like in this country. And to us, they're a place where people are both growing some food products and then they have chickens running around and a few cows in the back and then they've got corn in the lower 40 and that they're doing this in an integrated way um, with hopefully without a lot of chemical inputs. And wouldn't we love it if this was really how agriculture was um, working in the US and in small sectors it is. But um, the American farm, family farms, many of them, including dairy are in crisis right now. And um, I did a program in, uh, in New Hampshire recently and I looked at just the dairy, uh, the dairy data there and um, there were so many family farms that were in foreclosure. Uh, and so there's this consolidation, not just in dairy, but in also in our produce uh, and in beef cattle. Um, and watching these small, smaller or even medium-sized uh, farms that were the backbone of many of our agricultural communities is, is significant to nurses um, because they really are part of the, of the healthy and sustainable fabric of these communities. So what we're doing now is we're, we're doing farming on an industrial scale. We're doing farming the same way we produce cars, um, kind of assembly line. And so the majority of our animals, uh, the chickens the, uh, and other poultry, our hogs and our beef are all being produced in these concentrate, well, they're being produced um, in these very uh, confined spaces, often never getting to a pasture, just being fed in troughs. And they don't even call them farms anymore. They call them concentrated animal feed organs operations. And these are, um, these are not sustainable uh, for, for anybody, including um, the surrounding communities. And there are a variety of things that happen in the communities. So, um, what they, the, what this means is there are a lot more petrochemical farm uh, agricultural chemicals that are inputs that would otherwise not have to be used. In some interest, in 
instances, non-therapeutic antibiotics are being used to increase growth rates for the farm animals, um, the meat animals. Um, and then the, the ways in which they are using the land is completely unsustainable for the land itself. Hogs produce about um, seven pounds of waste a day, an adult hog. There are sometimes 5,000 hogs that are in a CAFO. And you can imagine the amount of waste this means for that immediate community. Um, I don't know that some of us can even imagine the smells that are produced um, and the people that are living in the surrounding areas show signs of increased stress including some physiological signs of increased stress from the smell alone. Um, the other thing is that um, many of these hog farms are in places like North, North Carolina where they get hurricanes. And when these holding ponds fail, this waste then flows downhill to um, whoever is living downhill, including the streams and rivers. Um, and so we've seen lots of instances, especially when there have been breaks in these holding ponds um, that have contaminated whole communities, as well as people's drinking water. Unlike human sewage, manure requires no wastewater treatment. So, uh, so th and this is, of course, a policy issue that this really should be treated um, as though it might potentially contain hazardous waste as well as biological um, waste, and, uh, and it's not. The legacy of hog farms in some of the areas where um, this is a closed hog farm. So they came in, they used up the land, and then they moved and they bought another farm. This company bought another farm and converted that into a CAFO. And once again, in places like North Carolina, um, we are seeing this particularly because North Carolina's crop used to be tobacco. And while some of them are moving towards soy, many of them just sold out and they sold to these hog farms. Um, these are chicken layers. These are not happy looking chicken layers, um, but they are produce, producing eggs and they are, um, uh, they are in these absolute confined spaces. Um, if you are not aware of where you're, uh, eggs are coming from, you really should look and see what kinds of conditions the chickens are, are in that are laying um, the eggs that you're consuming. Um, layers get um, 12 to 18 months to, li um, to live. I apologize. Layers get about 18 months to live. Um, starting at six months, a layer will produce very small little eggs. At 12 months, they'll be producing um, their normal size, um, medium and large eggs that you get in the grocery store. At 18 months, they, they, especially when they're under these kinds of stressors, they will decrease the amount of eggs they produce. I wanna say I have four-year-old chickens in my front yard, four-year-olds who are still giving me an egg a day. But those chickens that are in these confined situations are going to stop laying uh, consistently at 18 months. In Northern California, which is sort of the egg capital in California, when the chicken is eight, 18 months old, they sacrifice that chicken and they turn it into compost. They do not use the chicken itself for um, meat product, not even for pet food. They sacrifice them and um, they kill them and, and they become compost. Um, from chick, to fryers, these are the chickens we eat, these are not the layers, they um, have now bred them in such a way that they get to their full growth at 45 days. And that's when they get slaughtered and we get to eat those. Um, and once again, if you are buying fryers or roasting chickens, um, really good idea to know what kinds of um, conditions that they are being raised in whether they're being given any kinds of hormones, any kind of non-therapeutic antibiotics. Um, and there's not a good way to find this out unless you buy certified organic. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, many, many um, dairy cows in the United States, though less because there have been a lot of policy shifts and also the American consumer has learned about this and has looked for dairy that has been 
raised without the use of bovine growth hormones, but about 15% of the dairy cows in this country are given this growth hormone. And the only reason they're given this is to maximize their production of milk. But unfortunately, it also decreases their, um, their lifespan. It decreases their fertility. It increases the risk that their calves will be low birth weight, increases the risk of mastitis and lesions, which of course are particularly uncomfortable to the cow, um, puts them in pain. And these bovine growth hormones have been banned in many, many places in the world. Um, they're not necessary. And um, they've also been condemned by the Humane Society um, simply because of, of the risks that it, it provides to the dairy cow itself. So how would you know if your cow, uh, the cow that's produced the milk that you're buying uh, has bovine growth hormone or has been given bovine growth hormone? You wouldn't because it's not required to be on the bottle. And in some instances like Pennsylvania, the dairy industry actually tried, tied unsuccessfully to pass a law that said um, you could not put anything about bovine growth hormone on the bottle. So without uh, us having this information, we really can't make a, an informed decision about um, whether or not the cows were given this growth hormone, unless once again, you buy certified organic. We know that um, in agriculture in this country right now, they are using billions, literally billions of pounds of pesticides. Pesticides are formulated to kill or, or to um, interfere with reproduction of live beings, either plants if they are herbicide or insects if they are an insecticide. Um, there are also fungicides for molds. There are also pediculicides as nurses. We may know pediculicides, which are for head lice. But in agriculture, we use an enormous amount of these often petrochemically based uh, pesticides. And um, many of them, I'd hazard a risk to saying almost all of them that are used in agriculture production have some overall ecological risk, and many, many of them also have human health threats associated. Um, we will not be talking a lot about pesticides here. We will have two other future programs where we'll delve into pesticides a bit more. We do know that uh, farm workers have the sort of triple whammy of pesticide exposures um, because our child labor laws do not significantly cover children who work child farm workers. Um, and that is a whole policy arena that I think nurses should be more visible in uh, advocating for the children of farm workers who work in the fields. Um, so they have their occupational exposures. They then live nearby. So they'll have aerial um, spraying and community exposures. They track that into their homes. Um, what we know is that many pesticides are formulated to biodegrade in sunshine. So while they will biodegrade outside after a while, if you track them into your homes, uh, the, the active ingredient remains active if it's an area where sunlight does not have direct effect on them. Um, there are uh, a number of different categories of pesticides. Every one of them must be registered with the US Environmental Protection Agency. That does not mean that they are safe. It just means they're registered. Uh, the neonicotinoids, uh, which have been widely used as an insecticide, were shown when they registered to be potentially toxic to bees. We know that we've been having issues with bees in this country uh, for several years now, meaning we've had bee colony collapse syndrome uh, disease. And um, we know that when you create a chemical that's toxic to an insecticide, we, an insect rather, we should not be surprised that other insects besides the target insect may be affected. The iconic monarch butterfly, um, I live in California where we are one of the paths that the monarchs travel every year. They are down 80% this past year, 80% less monarchs on their path um, that they, their migration path. Uh, this is an ecological tragedy and a tragedy to the soul in so many ways. 
Glyphosate is, uh, is uh, commercially known as Roundup, is widely used as an herbicide for any of you who drink wine. I live in wine country in Sonoma County and only 1% of our vineyards here do not use glyphosate. So 99% of the wines that come from uh, Sonoma County you're likely, are likely to have been, the grapes have been grown using glyphosate. And then chlorpyrifos, um, which is uh, an organophosphate, uh, Organophosphates insecticide is a well-known neuroimmunotoxicant, also developmental toxicant, um, is, uh, is being banned in California and, um, and in the US, but not yet. Um, the agricultural chemicals, as well as industrial and commercial chemicals, act on the body much the same as pharmaceuticals. They're absorbed and transported into the body. We metabolize them sometimes into more toxic chemicals, not just less toxic. They can sometimes mimic, look exactly to the human body as though they are a hormone and thereby block. They can actually form into the hormone receptor sites, blocking them, turning them on, turning them off. They interact with gene expression and they can interfere with sensitive pe periods during fetal development. Um, and, and do note that some naturally occurring chemicals can do the same thing. So what does it mean to be certified organic? This is really important for all nurses to know that if it is a plant-based food, that uh, if it's USDA certified organic, that no harmful toxic chemicals have been used, no sewage sludge has been used on the fields, um, no petroleum-based synthetic fertilizers, no genetic mod um, modified organized organisms or other bioengineering, and no ionizing radiation for uh, dealing with um, bacteria. If it is a meat or dairy product, it means that um, no non-cloned animals can be used, no antibiotics can be given, um, and growth, no growth hormones. They will also be fed organic feed. So the organic certificate process, um, you have to have not used, if you're growing fruits or vegetables or nuts, not used any pesticides for three years, you then make an application, it's reviewed, they come on site and do an inspection, and then they do annual inspections. You have to submit your organic um, management uh, process to them and tell them how you're going to deal with potential insects, molds, et cetera, if you're growing a crop that is likely to have those kinds of things. It's a pretty reliable system and an important one for nurses to be able to speak about. So what did these labels mean? Natural, organic, pure, gluten-free? They mean nothing. There is no, there is no government certifying agent that will make sure that if they said it was these things, pure is lovely greenwashing, saying it's a natural product is lovely greenwashing. If they really want to do well by you, they should go for their cert certificate. Now, mind you, some small and medium-sized farmers that may bring their produce to local markets and local conveyors of their products, um, they may actually work without using pesticides. And you need to, especially at farmers markets, ask folks, how are they dealing with their, with their farms? Are they using pesticides? And you'll know because you now have a relationship with them. But otherwise we have to rely on their pesticides, on, um, on their being certified. This is a list um, of potential things to think about if we wanna bring uh, more sustainable, healthy uh, products to our healthcare settings. Um, obviously, antibiotic free, recombinant bovine growth hormone free, getting, having a preference for certified um, organic, certified co coffees, bringing in local, getting rid of those fast food zones, which we tell our patients not to eat that kind of food, but making sure our healthcare settings are not selling them. Uh, encouraging farmers markets. We developed when I was in Maryland, 12 farmers markets in Baltimore City that were associated with hospitals. Having hospital gardens, composting and reducing food waste, 
um, and uh, reducing vending machines um, and other things. A, a whole host of other things. And we have a speaker that is specifically going to be talking about that and has a half an hour to talk about that. So other ways of dealing with institutional purchasing are joining programs, farm to hospital programs, farm to school programs, farm to university programs. All of these are ways of helping to drive our purchasing, which in turn drives the market and tells farmers we want different kinds of pro products and different kinds of processes. So there are also very local opportunities um, for us to access um, uh, access fruits and vegetables, uh, community gardens, and the bottom one, which is uh, community supported agriculture. And um, this is where you may have some in your communities. You purchase ahead of time in the spring, you purchase food that will be harvested during the summer and the fall. And you purchase that from these community supported agricultures. So um, settings. So um, you could look those up. We'll find um, a link for you to find those in your area and put it in the chat. Um, what you do makes a difference. And you, you have to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. So choosing Every day we make a choice by what we're eating. Every day our institutions make choices in terms of what they purchase. Um, by continuing to go forth without changing, without moving ourselves towards more sustainable, more organic, more farmer friendly kinds of decisions, um, we will continue the status quo. But I really believe as nurses get more and more involved in uh, in food and agriculture, and especially around farm workers, but the whole food chain of workers as well, we can really address social determinants of health, we can address ecological health, we can address food security and nutrition security, which we're going to talk about later. And so I hope this just gave you the tiniest little bit of sort of nomenclature, as well as some of the things that are going on in modern day agriculture and where we might like to go. And, um, and with that, I think I have two minutes for questions. So if anybody has a question uh, in the chat, I can take those maybe one, maybe two questions, and then we're going to go on to our next speaker. And, um, I'm wondering if I'm going to stop sharing for a second so that I can look at the chat and see if there are any questions there. What happens to the layers? Uh, I see that one question there. And the layers are uh, at 18 months in the California um, egg industry, at 18 months they are killed and they are made into compost. And that compost is used, you know, is sold for agricultural purposes. So that's what happens to them. Uh, as a former school nurse, horrified by the meals that were served in schools, are there any groups that are doing advocacy around this? Yes, there are a number of policies that are being considered. One specifically in the, in the California legislature right now, and I think that we're going to be talking about policy at the end here. And we will specifically be talking about um, some of the policies around school lunches. So if I could ask you to just kind of hold on that one because we will be getting to it. Um, many states are looking at the quality of food um, for, for students. And some are looking at um, making all school lunches, breakfasts and snacks free to all students. And really then looking at the quality of those as a way of ensuring nutritional security. Um, and now it's 930, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. And um, our next speaker, Barbara Hollinger, is a nurse practitioner. 